What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit that like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. Also, if you enjoy cigars, spring is here. Do yourself a favor and support and check out our signature sit down cigar available from Bavada Cigar Club. The link to buy is in the pin, the comment, and description of this video. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get into another very interesting organized crime topic and whacking somebody. It's very normal in mob life. In fact, it's happened thousands of times over the 100 plus year history of the mafia in this country. Now, some whackings take elaborate planning and a long session of figuring things out. Guys like Paul Castellano and Albert Anastasia were taken out in extraordinary planned circumstances. Though there are several murders we have to scratch our head with, heads with and think, what the hell were they thinking? Today, we are going to take a look at arguably the dumbest mob hit of all time. The story of Anthony Nicodemo next on the sit down. Anthony Nicodemo was born October 27th, 1971 in Philadelphia. He would grow up in South Philadelphia near the stadium complexes not far from Broad Street and south of Snyder Avenue. Now, Nicodemo, not a lot is known about his youth. However, I have spoken to one individual that has lived in South Philadelphia his entire life. I asked him for five to 10 words describing Anthony Nicodemo. He made it clear he did not want to be identified, but he would say this, quote, He's one of the toughest people I've ever seen in South Philadelphia, and very few people could beat him in a street fight. He was a very ruthless individual and known very well to be able to handle himself in the streets. Now, for Nicodemo, he would actually turn up. We'd start seeing him in court footage of mobsters leaving courthouses. You can be seen uh, he can be seen in, in the background, you know, just kind of walking in in the, you know, kind of shadow, kind of looked at as an associate. And he was always around certain individuals in South Philadelphia. Nicodemo, though, according to himself, was a self-admitted realtor, broker, and notary. And according to PA Business Records, he had a real estate office in the area of 1246 Federal Street. In South Philadelphia, his real estate company was called Avenue of the Arts Realty Company. Now, according to a wiretap, Nicodemo at one point would claim to an associate that we'll get to that if anybody needed him, they can come directly to 1246 Federal Street, first floor. He would also discuss that he doesn't care if it's John Gotti's son. He doesn't care if it's Joe Valachi. He doesn't care if it's Carla Gambino's son. If anybody has a problem, you send them directly to 1246 Federal Street, first floor. Now, he would also discuss in that same wiretap, if anybody has a problem, hop on by to your friendly neighborhood realtor, to which he refers to the fact that you can again find him if you need him at that location. And he also goes into discussing other things, uh, which we'll get into. Now, According to the federal government, um, they would kind of first learn of Nicodemo in and around the late 90s and into the early 2000s. His name would first pop up in a case called Operation High Roller, which was investigated out of the Borgata Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. According to the federal government, inside the poker room, they would claim that people in organized crime had operatives, if you will inside the poker room that regularly played poker and were operating a very large scale sports betting operation. Now the state of New Jersey would mount a case that would come up in 2007. According to them inside the poker room, the state of New Jersey contends that between March, 2006 
in late 2007, the ringleader, a person called Andrew McCauley, a.k.a. Do, was the ringleader, uh, essentially operating a bookmaking network inside the casino. They would contend that McCauley, alongside his partner, a person called Jack Buscemi, allegedly received a percentage of the gambling proceeds collected by certain agents. It was also alleged that the certain casino employees that were also involved ignore the exchanges of cash and casino chips made by the ring to avoid financial reporting to the government. Now, they would also conduct extensive surveillance and observe the defendants, including McCauley, conducting business in the poker room. They would observe defendants accepting bets and settling up with bettors either by accepting payment on losses or paying out to winners. Now, they had all sorts of people involved in this operation, including the poker room supervisor, as well as certain employees, uh, cage attendants, that sort of thing. Now, Macaulay, as well, we have to make this clear, um, he was hit with not only a gambling, but money laundering. Now, in the end, it was said that this group with Macaulay and Buscemi brought in allegedly 30 plus million dollars in wagers. Now, again, notice what I discussed earlier about Nicodemo on tape talking to someone. In the conversation, he refers to someone as do. We would venture to believe that he is speaking to Macaulay. Now, according to the state of New Jersey, uh, the judge in the case that would bring charges on Nicodemo as far as uh, promoting gambling, he would say that this was a criminal case, but not a mob case. And in the end, Nicodemo um, essentially was charged with conspiracy in allegedly participating in this operation. Uh, most of the people involved got slaps on the wrist, but this is where we first learn about Nicodemo from a criminal standpoint. Now, also, this is interesting. In a sworn FBI affidavit, which discusses who exactly Nicodemo is, according to the federal government, he is the prime suspect in the 2003 murder of John Johnny Gong's Casa Santo. Now, Casa Santo would be whacked in his home in the 1200 block of Durfer Street after he invited someone in, turned his back, and he was subsequently murdered in his living room. Now, again, Nicodemo was never charged in this case, though the FBI, again, in his sworn affidavit, claimed they believed that to earn his button into the mafia in the early 2000s, he was tasked with this piece of work. The murder of Johnny Gong's Casa Santo has never been solved. Now we fast forward to 2012. Nicodemo is living a pretty good life. It's said that he's allegedly a mobster under the Joe Legambi regime of the mafia and Nicodemo's living good. He has kids, he's married, and he lives in the posh Packer Park neighborhood of South Philadelphia. Now, for anyone that is not aware, Packer Park is essentially right near I-95 and not far from the stadium complex. It actually, actually overlooks the stadium complex. This is one of the nicest neighborhoods in Philadelphia. It almost seems like you're living in a suburb. However, you are just a stone's throw away from the kind of Oregon Avenue, Broad Street neighborhood where the mob generally operates. Now, this area of Packer Park is most notably where a lot of mobsters live. Uh, years ago, Joey Molino lived in Packer Park. Joseph Legambi lives in Packer Park. A lot of made members of the mob live in Packer Park. And you look at it essentially, and I want to kind of relate this to New York. A lot of mobsters are from Brooklyn, right? It's small. It's packed. You know, there's a lot of people living on top of each other. Mobsters then go to Staten Island to get to a nicer area, bigger area. You got a yard. That's essentially what Packer Park is. A lot of these guys are from the small, tight, row-homed, small street and area of South Philly. And they go about five miles south or five minutes south and live in Packer Park. It's kind of a nice place to kind of graduate to when you get a family and a lot of mobsters do that. Now we fast forward to uh, December 12th, 2012 in the area of 2800 Eisminger street in South Philadelphia. Now for me, I intimately know this area. I lived 
about a block away from this area. I lived right near there. And I actually remember the exact day this happened. I was in my home this day. I remember. I remember seeing all the police. I lived on 2600 Watts, which is very close to this area, right by Marconi Plaza. Now, at approximately 3 o'clock on December 12, 2012, this individual, Gino DiPietro, walked out of his home in the area of 2800 Eisminger. As he walked out of his home, he was approached by a mass gunman and shot on the street. He would die at that location. Now, according to a witness, within 15 minutes, they would tell police that they saw a masked man jump into a Honda Pilot, one similar to this one, and drive off. Now, the witness also was able to get a look at the tag. The tag would immediately bust back to Anthony Nicodema. That within 15 minutes, they would arrest Nicodemo at his home in the 3200 block of South 17th Street in Packer Park. Now, upon getting a warrant on the Honda Pilot, they would locate a 357 Smith & Wesson tied in a towel and a mask behind the driver's seat in the Honda Pilot. Within 10 minutes, Mr. Nicodema was arrested at his home. Now, understand, literally, from what I've heard, before Nicodemo could even get home, the police were already at his home. That's how quick this thing figured itself out. This is one of the, if true, stupidest little stunts ever conducted by members of the mafia. Now, I want this to be made clear. According to the DA, the Philadelphia District Attorney, they would state, explicitly they do not believe nicodemo was the gunman they believe he was the driver in this murder i want it to be made clear the gunman that killed gino di pietro has never been arrested no one has ever been charged with it i am not going to mention who people believe it is south philadelphia is very small many people believe they know who the gunman is. That said, the feds don't go off conjecture. They don't have proof. And Nicodemo, which we'll learn down the road, has decided to not speak on this. He is the only person on the planet who knows who the gunman is. Yet, he will not say who it is. We can argue this is one of the most laughable hits ever conducted on we, what we think behalf of the mafia. Now, the questions after this murder lent to why. On the surface, Gino DiPietro was a guy who, yes, in the 90s served some prison time, but over the last 10 or so years, up until 2012, he had lived a pretty good life. He had a job. He was going to get married to his fiance, seen here. He would take his mother to church and watch Phillies games with her. He still frequented the area, though there is things we would learn about Gino DiPietro. According to many people, it has been discussed that he may have been an informant. And why we know that is multiple people have discussed, including a person seen here, Nikki Slick DiPietro. According to a jailhouse letter received by the government, they would state that an unidentified inmate claimed that he had heard on multiple times Nikki Slick DiPietro, who was the cousin of Gino DiPietro, discussing things regarding uh, Mr. Uh, DiPietro. Nikki Slick would claim, according to this inmate, quote, he always talked about Gino DiPietro and how Gino ratted on his little brother, Victor DiPietro. The inmate would claim that Nikki Slick said, quote, let him breathe the air for a year then I'm going to get his lights turned out. He would also say that DiPietro had been making comments about Gino lately saying, boom, 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 before the papers even came out, saying, quote, Gino will be in the papers soon. Now, Nikki Slick DiPietro would respond in a letter and say, quote, you know, the streets are saying I approve this, which is a complete fabrication. Then again, I'd never oppose a rat getting 86th. So Nikki Slick 
this inmate claimed was a part of this and ordered this. Though Nikki Slick, who is, I want to make this clear, serving life in prison for murder, has claimed he had nothing to do with this, though he didn't really mind that his cousin got took, taken out because it has been pointed out that Gino DiPietro may have been an informant. Now, it's also been discussed that Gino P DiPietro was actively informing and that he may have been rooting around trying to get information on the murder of Johnny Gong. That's also another thought here, though we don't really know. In the end, there is one thing we do know, and that is Gino DiPietro was whacked. Now, a trial date would be set, and Nicodema would have to face the charges that were presented to him, including murder in the first degree. Now, what we would find very bizarre about this trial is initially a trial was set and the thought was they were going to go to trial. Defense attorney for Nicodemo, Brian J. McMonagall, would present a truly bizarre defense in this case. He would claim for Nicodemo that essentially Nicodemo discussed that he was carjacked that afternoon by mass gunmen who ordered him to drive away from the scene of Gino DiPietro and that the gunman would then jump out of the Honda a few blocks away from the murder scene and left the gun behind. So essentially, he states that he was just a good citizen and that he was forced to drive away from the scene by people that carjacked him uh, and that he was just an unsuspecting passerby. Um, obviously a ridiculous defense. And eventually Nicodema would throw up the white flag. He would down the road, agree to a plea deal in which his lawyer would state that he did it to basically save his family. He's a young guy, but he's also um, a guy who you know wants to get out at some point and he did it for his family. Anthony Nicodema was ultimately hit with 25 to 50 years in state prison. He currently sits at SCI Phoenix, a state prison not far from Philadelphia. Anthony Nicodemo in an updated photo can be seen here. He is 52 years old and will first be eligible for state parole in 2038. He will be 66. Keep in mind when he went in prison, he was just around 40 years old. Now, it was presented to Anthony Nicodemo that he could cooperate in this case and start a new life for himself. But to him, the Philly mob was worth doing 25 plus years for. We have to say one thing about Mr. Nicodemo. He is definitely a loyal individual. He believes in the code. that You do not speak about what goes on. What I find very interesting in this, though, is if he was absolutely involved with this, why he was so sloppy and the other person was so sloppy in this, especially if, let's just say, he may have done other things. Nicodema will be quite old, even on his first parole spot. He may not even get it at that point. He has to serve at minimum 25 years. I have one question for Nicodemo, and I'm just curious, quite honestly, though I have many questions. My whole thing would be he has sat in prison for, you know, essentially the last 12 years. He's not in the feds either. Remember that. He is in a state prison. Not a lot of mobsters in state prison, right? It might be one or two, but not many. And I'd have to think there are probably Philly guys in there that he's hanging around with. He's definitely a respected guy. My question to Nicodemo is, how would he feel seeing some of the recent things going on with this family? You know, certain people on the Internet. Kind of a crazy family, isn't it? Uh, but one person that is deciding to live on his laurels is Nicodemo, which in the end, he took responsibility for his crime and doing his time like a man. I hope you enjoyed this video. What do you think of this hit? It has to be one of the most ridiculous mob hits of all time. In the comments below, which one did I miss? Are there other crazy mob murders? Let me know what you think. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.